Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I'm Dr. Anthony Salas. I'm the Secretary General of the International Council on Archives, and I'm your chair for this afternoon's session. Session 1.2, User-Centered Design Thinking as a Driver for Innovation. So before we begin, like many of the sessions, I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is the traditional land of the Kaurna people, and that, <coughs> excuse me, we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge that the Kaurna people, as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region, and that their cultural and her heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Kaurna people today. So engaging, users, engaging our users in, is becoming an important part of the archival process and how, do we, and how we build our systems so that they are transparent, intuitive, and frictionless. <coughs> this will help us, this will help not only our users better utilize the important materials in our collection, but allow us the opportunity to explore innovative ways of explore, exploiting and adding value to our archival collections. Our speakers today will be looking at different ways of engaging users and stakeholders from the perspective of a government, a municipality, and a university. Today's first paper is, is from, I'm going to, and I apologize for the pronunciation, uh, Catherine Blenzer and Espen Schwab, Sojval, thank you, uh, from the National Archives of Norway, called Design Thinking as a Driver for Innovation at the National Archives of Norway. Uh, Espen is the director in, in charge of public and private sector at the Archives of the National Archives of Norway since 2017. And before that, he was the director in the Department of ICT and Modernization in the Ministry of Local Government and Modernization. So please welcome Espen. Hello. Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> well, I'm Espen, I come from Norway, and I'm not going to bother you with all the everything about the Norwegian society, but I guess you need to know something about. Uh, the National Archives and what we do. Uh, I've been with the Archives for three years and uh, our Director General Inga, who is the, the Chief Archivist, she's been about five years. And, and the management team is quite new. And when Inga came in five years ago, there was a realization that the National Archives, they were not very modern. Um, the perception was that it was more like a steam engine train moving at its own pace, um, taking stops sometimes from, uh, from time to time and then trundling, trundling along. While the rest of the world, at, at least the rest of the Norwegian society, is moving quite high pace uh, and going digital. Uh, the National Archives, were, they were thinking about digital, discussing digital, but they weren't kind of living digital. They were quite <coughs> paper based. I mean, we still are, but we have been moving forward. And I'm going to talk about how do we work with modernizing an organization? How do we prepare for digital? And we cannot stop. We want to do this in as we go, because uh, modernizing is not something you can just stop and think about for you and then implement. We have to work with this all the time and uh, rebuilding the organization to make it uh, adaptable to, uh, to, to a society that is based on digital. <coughs> and because we think if, we, if we're not able to adapt the National Archives into a digital type, we will become a museum and somebody else will take over our role. So we're in the process of, of building a new, changing our engine from the steam, steam-based engine into a more an old diesel or electric engine. And we're in the process. We're still working on this. So we haven't changed all the, all the carriages, uh, all the wagons in the train. But we our ambition is to keep on changing them going forward. Then you might say maybe train isn't the best, best, um, best picture of what we're doing because probably there is no tracks where we're going. So we will sometimes have to switch also the wheels to get them into I don't know, off road driving or something because the train we're moving into is an unknown territory. So in this presentation, I'm going to first talk about uh, put, you, put Norway into a context where how is the Norwegian society based at the, at the current day, and then go into some of the issues, some of the problems we perceive in the, in the public sector today, and then how we approach how we how do we work this. How do we solve these problems? How do we innovate uh, together with the public sector? And um, I'll sum up with some of our, our proud moments this far, the last three or four years. So looking at Norway in brief, Norway is a quite small country, but it's, it's quite digital. In the European com comparison of, of European economies, Norway is doing the fourth best when it comes to becoming digital. 
Right among the, the small differences between the top four countries. If you look at the lower end of the of the bar, it's about public digital services. So that so the EU compares how how are the different European countries comparing when it comes to pro providing digital services to the citizens. And the Norwegian population is they have been di digital for a long time. If you see it's time spent. They they spend continuously more and more time on their screens. And the time spent on screens is more and more internet based, or cell phone based, and video. So reading newspapers and, and watching um, regular analog, um, what's called the regular TV transmissions is going down while the internet is kind of taking over. And also if you look at how, inter how the interaction between citizens and, and the public sector is, I think it's between 90 and 95% of all citizens that are, have digital contact with either local governments or the central government um, to, to, to get their services. So the world has become, or at least the Norwegian economy has become very digital. And then we can't be discussing how, what to do with all our paper anymore. It's, kind of, it's not really relevant for the public sector or, or all of our papers. We need new approaches. And this really came into the, the challenges we, we, we face really came into account when uh, two years ago, when the, the Auditor General of Norway, he reported, they, they did a study on it. How good is the public sector, especially the central government, in, in documenting their actions, documenting their decisions? And uh, the Auditor, Auditor General, he spent a few years on this, and his findings were kind of down striking. They found out that the ministries in Norway they are basically they have huge gaps in their records. They do have records, uh, but um, it's mostly the uninteresting stuff that gets into the record systems. All the interesting stuff that they keep it outside <laughs> outside of the record system. <laughs> and it's just not one ministry or one department. It's it's general. It's all over the place. All of them are, are having huge difficulties in, in coping with the going. Digital, going away from paper into digital, and keeping good records in the process. And so it's both ministries and it's the, the agencies, the police department, every, the whole chain, they don't document what they're doing anymore. And some, some of the important issues that the Order the General found was that it's not kind of just the small processes, it's the really important processes that will be interesting for both the parliament today and researchers tomorrow and the future in, in 100 years. So like when it comes to Norwegian foreign policy, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they don't, um, they don't keep records. Or they keep records, they have few records. But Norway, you, there's a story in, in 2010, the, uh, the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize went to a, a Chinese uh, opposition uh, politician, called Liu Xiaobo. And whereas the Nobel Peace Committee is, is an individual uh, organization, it mostly represents retired politicians in Norway. So the Chinese government, they said, well, this looks like a political decision and that is harmful to China. So they put Norway in the, in the freezer, in the political freezer. For, we're, still, we're still warming up, it's become better, but for many years it was really, really, there was not a good relationship between Norway and China. And so you would think that the Norwegian foreign ministry, they were doing quite a lot of re research and analysis and, and actions on how to improve this relationship. Uh, the Auditor General, if they found that, whereas when you go into the records, they found virtually no documents on how did the Ministry of Foreign Affairs work towards China and improving relations. But when they did go into other, other area, digital areas, like the email server, they found about a million documents. With certain, when they're researching in China and bilateral relations. So, so they do quite a lot of work. It doesn't, it doesn't come into the right place. Because of regulations and how to cope with systems, the information overflow, people don't, the, the case workers and, and middle management of Norwegian ministries, they don't, um, they haven't got the time to do anything. Because it becomes self-served, and the, the formats that are coming, they're not, paper was very easy to handle, Whereas how do you treat a tweet, a tweet or a text message or a blog post or whatever it comes, all the different digital formats that come? How do you record Microsoft Teams? What, what, in reality what they do, they just, they don't care about recording anymore. They just, they, they get their job done, that's what their priorities are, and they, they move on. 
the result will be that digital records, they will, they will disappear. So this is obviously, obviously a situation we can't live with. Um, so they find that everybody finds the situation unmanageable. And how do we approach this? How do we go about, when we have a paper-based organization ourselves, how do, how do we go about to kind of change the mindset, both internally and towards policymakers in the public sector? And we come quite quickly to realize that this is not only an archival problem anymore. Because it, the world has become very complex. And in, in Europe, and I guess people outside of Europe also have heard about the, the GDPR. It's a, it's a regulation how to treat per, uh, personal data. It's been quite strict, and they want to delete everything, basically. It's like short, the short, that, that's at least the, how it's perceived. <coughs> so you have kind of legislation, other legislation and archival that, that, that affects our, our area of interest. And then you have the ICT vendors. They do, they make user-friendly solutions. They don't care about the archiving when they make solutions because they want to have users using their systems. And budgets are going, always going down, so people don't have money to invest in new solutions. So it's kind of a complex, complex world the public sector is moving into. And how do we approach it? So we thought we need to start innovating and we need to, to change the way we tell stories. We need to change the way we challenge existing truths. And we've been using a, a methodology called service design to kind of to start doing this. And we found it very fruitful. Oh, this didn't turn out quite the way it should be. But uh, anyway, um, so, so the, the basis of service design is that you have to think about the user first. We can't sit at the National Archives and, and think, how do we solve a problem? We have to actually go out there, ask the different user group and say, what is your problem? How do you perceive this and this? And why is it a problem? And what makes it a problem? How much time do you spend on it? All these things, we need to gather information on and how is the problem from the user perspective. So you have to talk to people from all different sort of, of, of uh, work groups, both citizens, middle managers, case workers, artists, everybody. And you need to be holistic. So the methodology tries to lift, okay, you have a set of problems, but you need to put them into a context where you look at the whole value chain, for example. And how does a problem for a user in, in one part of the, the um, of, of the value chain, how does that affect the rest of the chain? And how, how do you solve this? Maybe you solve the user problem in a completely different place than what you would think. And we're very um, working quite a lot with cooperation. We need to put the different topic experts together and make them work, with, work the problems together. Otherwise, we get kind of biased solutions that doesn't necessarily help our, help our problems. And we need to challenge existing, existing truths. There's so many, especially in the, in the field of archives, archives, so many people say, oh, you, we can't do this, we can't do that, and we, we've always done it this way. And then we have to challenge, why, why is that? Are you sure we can't change it? Are you sure that it wouldn't be, work, uh, wouldn't be fruit, fruitful to try it another way? And um, because often they, these existing tools, they are based on a paper mindset, whereas in a digital world, they're, 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 they're not, not longer relevant, they're not, not they don't have kind of the strength that they used to have. And the fifth version, or fifth um, aspect of user service design is to work visually. It's, hard, it's harder for people to understand reading a long text and seeing a picture of how do you think this could be solved. It's much easier to get a debate from different uh, fields of expertise when you look at something visual rather than having a text. Because we use words differently. The meaning of information management is different if you come from an archives perspective whether it's a computer science, or if you're just somebody kind of taken off the street. So working visually, it, it makes things, it, it, it improves the discussion and the dialogue. It's much easier to kind of have a, have a fruitful discussion on how to achieve our goals. And finally, we, we're working iterative. We don't, have, we don't do large projects over several years and say, okay, this is the solution, this is the requirements document, and then somebody goes out and, and, and builds something. We need to prototype, learn what, what, what does this prototype mean, how do people perceive it, take it, take that knowledge and make a new prototype, and then a new, and a new, and a new, and continuously improving how you work. And, and focus on what, what do you learn. Not if they, something looks good, but what do you learn from using a prototype or first version of, of something going into, into life service. And I've been inspired by, you know, the, there's, a, there's a big service called LinkedIn, 
where people, <coughs> it's kind of competitive with Facebook but for business networks. And the CEO of LinkedIn, he says that if you launch something and you're comfortable launch it, launching it, then you've been de developing for too long. You need to feel uncertain. You need to be uncomfortable launching a new service because it, it, it's not supposed to be perfect. But then the first thing you do after you launch, you find, find out what doesn't work and how can you improve it. So you continuously improve on and how, how, to, how, to, how, to, how do we do things better. Um, so we need to continuously improve. This is a, a vital part of the service design thinking. And then if you look into the results, because what, the methodology of, of, from what I understand, and you know, from my, my knowledge of my um, uh, experience, when working with service design, we, we get challenged in how we think and how we approach things. And one of the things we quite early learned was that our, our owners, or the Ministry of Cultural Affairs, they didn't really understand what the problems we brought on their tables. So we need to have new storytelling to, 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 to pitch our problems in a different way. And not only for the Ministry, not only the stakeholders kind of above us, but also all the stakeholders in the public sector that we meet. We need to approach them in a different way and, and, and challenge the things they think are true. And one of the things we started early on was to figure out how, how we shift our resources from one area to another. We need to free up our organizations and become the paper base into approaching digital areas. And the truth that we've been working with quite hard is that we need to store everything that's made on paper, on paper, for the eternal fraternity. I don't know what happened to my, my presentation because it didn't look like this <laughs> when I made it. But, but <clears throat> we've been doing for, for quite a long, long years, we, we're, we've been analyzing and testing can we actually throw away all the papers? Well, not all of them, but most of them. And we did first an, an economic analysis proving that today we're at a tipping point where digital becomes cheaper than storing things in, on paper because real estate is costly. Whereas digital is, is becoming steadily more and more cheap. And so first we did the analysis, then we went into some offices testing out does this hypothesis work? And the end result is that out of 250 kilometers of paper archives and still in the public sector, we're probably going to throw away 230,000 of them. Not going to, but we're going to digitize most of it, so we're going to store the information, but not the paper. And most of these papers, they were basically, they were written on a computer and printed out. So there's no intrinsic value in the paper. So let's scan it, throw it away, and it's economically viable. So that will improve the long-term cost of the national archives. We also approach how do we have a dialogue with the, with the, with the public sector on, uh, on transferring archives to us. So we, we basically increase the amount of archives being transferred to us by using half the staff doing it. So we've been freeing up, staff, freeing up staff to do other tasks. Because we did it inefficiently before. But we didn't realize because we were always, we've always been doing it this way, so let's keep on doing it. And we do inspections, and the way we do inspections, we realize that people didn't, didn't understand the inspection report we sent, the inspection reports we sent to them. So we had to redo, how do we do inspections and how do we make them understand what their problems are. And uh, so we've been, been changing the inspections and people are seeing, seemingly, the feedback so far is that they're very positive about it. People understand our, our inspection, inspection reports much better now than they did previously. So it's a gift, wrap, a gift pack for, for the public sector. Oh, well, it's um, formatting here, it's been really, really, really bad. Uh, but we've also managed to, and I think it's the first time in the National Archives of Norway's history, we managed to get a huge investment from the from the Ministry of Cultural Affairs to develop a new solution for uh, for making archives available. Uh, and it's not going to be our own solution. This is going to be a solution for all of the public sector. So all the municipal sector, they're going to publish their digital art archives into our solution. But it will be their ownership. So, so it will be presented as their archives, but it's a one common solution to, to make everything available. And this is something we, we wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have gotten those funding if we hadn't changed the way we argued towards politicians. Because politicians, they don't care about problems. They care about how can they get kind of political uh, profilation. 
how do they get the company in the news and become the heroes of whatever topic they're, they're working on? So we need, we need to help them look good. And to that, the main problem with how do we do archives in a digital context? We're not, we haven't found all the solutions yet. But we have to establish a mission. But government employees, they should not be, they sh should not need to spend any time on archiving when they do their work. We're working on a concept, I know it's spreading between some countries, called archiving by design. We've been learning from the Netherlands. And the whole concept is, uh, we, we shouldn't have record systems. We should have systems that automatically just makes records. Because when people have to shift the information from whatever system they're working in into a record system, it's, it's not happening. And it's going to get worse moving forward. So we need to make the systems that being, are being used into record systems, not the other way around. So that's our mission, and we're going to continue working on how to how do we make this happen. Uh, but we're not still there yet. So basically, that's that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. by Deborah Verhoeven, Alana Piper, Mike Jones, and Peter Sefton from the University of Technology, uh, University of Technology Sydney. Um, our presenters today are Mike Jones and uh, Deborah Verhoeven, and I apologize if I mispronounced the name. So Mike, is, uh, Mike Jones is an archivist, historian, and collections consultant with more than a decade of experience, working with universities and the GLAM, libraries, galleries, libraries, and archives, and museums sector. And in 2018, he completed his PhD at the University of Melbourne. Deb Verhoeven is, the, is, Canada, is, from, is Canada 150 Research in Gender and Culture Informatics at the University of Alberta. And before this, she was the Associate Dean of Engagement and Innovation at the University of Technology Center. So welcome both of our presenters up today. Thanks, Anthea. Uh, yes, I hail from cooler climates than Adelaide will be, but today we're enjoying the sunshine, um, and I'm back from Australia for about six months, so um, more time to work on some of these things, which relate to the period of time I would give to us as an associate dean of engagement. So what my I will be talking about is a little different than Esme's talk in the sense that it's been focused on research collections, and in particular, research collections as they evolve out of a data, collections as a data uh, system uh, and an approach to what we call critical infrastructure studies. So there's a kind of framework in which this talk participates. We're just going to jump into the middle because that's sort of what the talk is about. Um, so uh, when I was the uh, Associate Dean of Engagement and Innovation at UTS, we were confronted with some very specific problems around <coughs> staff who were in a faculty of arts and social sciences uh, being attracted to the idea of research engagement as delivered through online collections or online representations of their research, but not necessarily having an idea or an inkling about how to produce those collections and what to do with them once they had them. Um, so they were very motivated by their collections, but not necessarily um, well versed in collections behaviour or in the kinds of things that Esther was talking about in terms of this idea that uh, archiving might just be built into a process rather than something that I actually have to go and do. Um, so that problem sat within a framework for me which was much uh, more largely informed by the work I've been doing around building <coughs> digital infrastructure over a long period of years uh, for research collections. And that, that bigger set of questions are the questions that really underlie this talk, and they're quite abstract. How might we use data and data tools in that context to understand the redistributive power? So how do we open up archiving to bigger, broader philosophical questions that are, in, are really quite inspiring for humanities researchers in particular? How do we do that to redress domination and gatekeeping in every phase of a process of building collections and distributing and sharing them? How do we do that? Not by focusing on the data itself, but by thinking about what we do with data and what data does to us. How do we shift from a focus, for example, on open data to thinking about data that produces openness? So how do we make these shifts away from thinking just about the data to the bigger thinking problems that underlie our collections? 
How do we, for example, get beyond a focus on moving data to finding approaches to data that move us? And I'm thinking here of a very early uh, definition of data that Alfred Wilkinson came up with, where he said, data is really just the potential for feeling. So how do we think about movement in a slightly different way, instead of thinking just about interoperability and the movement of data through the systems, how do we think about what data might do to us in terms of movement? How do we shift from ways of working towards data transparency, working towards data transparency that are actually also about truly making ourselves transparent? How might design thinking contribute both possibilities and potentially some limitations to opening up those ways of thinking and working with data? So why design thinking? Uh, and I really I love that this session and all three papers will kind of tackle design thinking from different perspectives. One of the nice things about design thinking is this idea that it's very solution focused and that rather than focusing too much on workflows, you actually sit down to work, to think about workarounds. Uh, and that idea of roundness is very important think, to some of the ways in which we're trying to develop this work. Um, so it's solution focused, but it doesn't claim to always resolve every aspect of a problem. It's abductive and productive in its thinking. So abductive in the sense that it focuses on puzzles and, and trying to respond to puzzling or exasperating or problematic aspects of uh, a situation or a scenario. Um, and it's really focused on this sort of co-evolving solution problem. That as you develop solutions, more problems will simply arise. And you need to develop more solutions to those. So there's this constant iteration at the level of the problem. Uh, so again, uh, these uh, become quite generative ways of thinking about how to ask people with no knowledge of archiving or information management to start working in these spaces. So in this sense, there are also then challenges proposed by design thinking. If design thinking is a solution, then it's also uh, going to generate problems because problems and solutions are co-evolving all the time. And I find uh, some of these questions quite interesting. So how do we design archives in a world where even the idea of solutions might be elusive? You know, we're, in, we're living in a world now where we have a very, very, very big problem and no real solution to it yet, if there ever will be one. Can we support integrative thinking uh, the sort of integrative thinking that design thinking relies on, but also incongruous thinking, which I think would be very interesting. And we celebrate design thinking a lot for its human centeredness, but I'm actually much more interested in the idea that we can have community centered approaches to the archive, not just human centered ones in the very individualistic way that sometimes we end up focusing on. Um, and I think that this idea of um, moving away from uh, just bringing in community at a certain point in the consultation process to actually genuinely believing that the purpose of building these collections of data is to build communities. So not bring them in but build them or to redefine what communities might be is a really important aspect of this new approach. Um, you will find as we move through this talk that we will be thinking of design thinking as long term non linear. And that we're very interested in this idea of moving away from just collaboration to thinking also about cooperation. Okay, so that's the setting. What was the problem that I had to solve as the Associate Dean of Engagement and Innovation? We had a very specific problem in the faculty, and that was the Dean had a fund for engagement, and she had released that fund every year for five years prior to me arriving, and these same four people applied for the funding and got it every single time. And those same four people never told anybody that they got it or how much they got or what they were working on. So she called me into her office and said, I have a problem I need you to solve. Can you please help me make more transparent the kinds of funding operations that occur in the faculty around research engagement? I said, yes, I can help solve that. And so what we did is we developed a platform called RAMP. Uh, research and amplification. So this is a platform specifically designed to support research engagement of humanities scholars in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at UTS. And we built it in collaboration with the crowdfunding platform Possible.com. Some of you may have heard of that platform. It's been uh, very successful in generating crowdfunding for all kinds of endeavors across Australia, including research, but not specifically research. But we designed this as an in-house system only. So RAMP was designed 
to take the Dean's money, which I did, and then I amortized it across all the staff, so I gave every staff member $350 of real money and told them they could spend it, but not on themselves. They could spend it on somebody else's research engagement project, and they did. So, oh look, I'm having the same problem as we had. Um, so RAMP was designed to solve a number of problems. It was designed to solve a lack of transparency and opportunities for colleagues to actually green light each other's projects, not the dean in a, a dark and obscure way, um, and to then become involved in the conceptualization of research engagement projects at the outset, before they'd even begun, before they had funding. It was also designed to, um, in a sense, breach those institutional hurdles for collaboration and collegiality that often exist in medium to large sized organizations like universities. And it gave me a fabulous opportunity to think about what staff really thought research engagement was, without me setting the terms for them in an existing process. So they were encouraged to just put research engagement projects up in whatever way they defined them. At the moment in the university sector, research engagement is largely defined for us by the federal government. Uh, I wanted to, and it's largely defined therefore for STEM disciplines, not for people working in HAS disciplines. I want to see or hear or feel what humanities researchers thought engagement might be. Um, and so this is a really good opportunity for me to see that. And it gave me one other really great piece of information. I could focus on how people behaved when they were given money to spend on their colleagues. So I could work out who were the people with the most extended or extrinsic generosity behaviors. And they could become my champions for a new way of thinking about collegiality. Because of course I had the, the view, as did any of the researchers in the program, of who was donated and how much. Um, so this is what RAP looked like. Um, you could just, it's like a normal crowdfunding platform, you could click on each of these boxes, you could send messages, you could uh, engage with the researchers. Many people discovered work that their colleagues were doing, they had no idea, they offered their own services or their own um, knowledge to those researchers. Um, and what we discovered is that there were three or four projects in here that were explicitly digital archiving projects. But this was a clearly um, predominant way of thinking about research engagement. Uh, for humanities researchers, online archives. Um, so what did that mean uh, in terms of then having to generate new workarounds? Uh, this just gives you a bit of an overview of RAMP. So it's about $38,000. Um, largest average donation is about 150 Most typical donations are about $100 and so on. So yeah, we've produced a, a full detailed analytical report on this, which is a, a whole other track that we're not going to do today. Um, and then we um, did it again because we learned from the mistakes of the first iteration and we then reiterated it um, and learned from those mistakes the first time around. Um, and again, what you'll see here is a large number of um, digital archives. So there's an indigenous digital archive in here as well. Thank you. All right. So, what were the emergent problems that came out of that first iteration of RAMP? Um, we can see that researchers increasingly saw online collections and archives as an expected form of research engagement, but they really didn't have an awareness of how to do it. They didn't have very clear expectations about how long the university would provision web services, and they certainly had no idea about best practice guidelines for managing the control of the data. Um, the solution to that was uh, to call in the researchers that were interested in working in this method and ask them to consider using a, a content management system like a Mecca to start to give them some of the structure that they were lacking around how to work with their data in a way that was more shareable and findable. So a Mecca then became a solution that solved a number of initial problems. Um, how do we develop models for um, standardized approaches that actually didn't limit the researchers uh, in particularly um, egregious ways? and how can we work with researchers uh, on managing their expectations around data management. Uh, these were the resulting archives, which were built in association with students from the Information Knowledge Management course, courses at UTS. Um, highly successful, all the researchers were very happy with the results. However, there were more emergent problems. The Mega S is not a professional <coughs> system, and although it is open source and therefore reasonably sustainable, it does uh, 
operate using these uh, plugins or modules, which can become quite unstable as the software itself goes through new iterations. Which leads us to the preservation problem that Mike will now talk about. Uh, so as Deb mentioned, uh, the Omega sort of platform didn't provide those preservation opportunities, uh, and we're also looking for ways of moving data from an Omega system into other systems in an effective way. Uh, Pete Sefton at UTS was uh, working on technical aspects of the project and developed this idea of uh, data crates. Uh, he is not here today because he's actually presenting on this very topic at the Research Australasia that's happening this same week. Uh, so the idea of data crates uh, and some of the problems that they started to address, there were these issues uh, where researchers did ways of distributing self-describing packages of data. So getting data into a packet with more metadata than traditionally in there, the metadata is not out in a separate system, for example. The self-describing package of data that's the system agnostic can be moved around or run up again or preserved and stored more effectively. Uh, there were ways this could be used to enable the discovery of the data by exposing metadata as widely as possible, so this could become uh, an access uh, opportunity as well. It assisted in setting some of those expectations around web services, so uh, web services, for example, could be provided for a set period of time, and then the data and all the information required to understand that piece of research put into a data crate they used as a, as a sort of storage package, and at some point potentially run up again in the future. Uh, but meant that the sites themselves and those systems didn't have to be maintained in perpetuity. Uh, and also allowed for automatic automated ingest into other repositories and catalogs, such as Honey in the Humani Humanities Network Infrastructure Project, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, so this is a diagram of where the data crate sort of fits within the broader areas that we're talking about here. Uh, so you see Amica S there over on the left-hand side, uh, the data crate in the middle with all these export and import functions around it. Uh, there are file storages and GitLab, there are OAI feeds, which in this case go to Honey, but could go to other aggregators as well. Uh, and as we've mentioned, this is not about a single linear pipe that we're talking about here. These are different possibilities of open into different spaces uh, and different uh, sort of domains. But there are some sort of emergent problems here as well in terms of the data crate. Uh, there's a focus on sort of fixity rather than the revisability and the recursive approaches that humanities, arts and social sciences researchers are more comfortable with and a fundamental part of the research that we do. Uh, there are some challenging technical issues there uh, for typical HAS researchers who aren't necessarily technologically savvy enough to deal with this notion of the data crate and the way that it works. And also the data is still organized in a fairly standard sort of collection of item hierarchy with standard-based metadata for interoperability. And as part of the research that we do, we're interested in more expansive kind of iterations and relationships that go outside some of those kind of formal structural codifications of knowledge. Which is where Honey comes in. Uh, and Honey wasn't developed as part of this uh, sort of broader set that we've been talking about here. It's been around since 2014. <laughs> Uh, this slide looks like it's sort of exploded off the bottom a bit. Uh, I don't need to read out all of these, but just to focus on the first couple. Uh, so, Humanities Network Infrastructure is an idea to enable humanities researchers to create their own collections as data and incorporate them into larger aggregated pools of data. So, taking your research data set and putting it in this space where you can create relationships between your own data and your own sort of entities and entries and the big humanities research data sets that have been created over many years by many institutions around the country. Uh, and that supports those kind of non-linear and recursive and community-based knowledge building activities and research methods that are practiced in the humanities. So a quick flip through some of the sort of current status. There are now more than 30 data sets that have been mapped. There are more than 18 million entities in Honey in the aggregated data set. So that's the sort of space that researchers using this sort of data crate idea in this case can bring their data into Honey and start mapping relationships between their own work and this set of more than 18 million entities. Uh, it's openly available. You can log in via social media, but you don't need to, so you can go onto the site and browse around. Uh, we don't have a link on this page, but there'll be one at the end. Uh, and there are graph search features that were launched a couple of years back, uh, which allow you to search through the relationships <coughs> as well as the entities and find out things like number of relationships to get from one entity through to another entity, so you can start looking at pathways and trails and navigating your way through. 
just some of the data sources to flip through that are in Honey. Uh, so it's Auslit, the Circus Oz Living Archive, Design and Art of Australia Online, eMelbourne, uh, for the iAccess Collections Catalog, Finding Connect Web Resource. Uh, and this is bringing in all these different data elements, so concepts, events, organizations, people, places, works, uh, and allowing users to work in this space. <coughs> so what users can do with Honey is discover and explore that aggregated data, as you would expect in this sort of system. Uh, but going beyond that, users can make their own connections. They can create relationships and describe and tag those relationships with any terminology they like. Uh, so they can develop those relationship descriptions and also they can encounter relationships that other people have made. So I'll get to that on the slide in a moment. Uh, so you can save and share that data and your findings. And in this interest of sort of building a community of knowledge, people can navigate from the collections they've made between their data and say a large data set and will encounter the relationships that someone else has made. So you start encountering these networks of knowledge that people have created in different domains. And you can create and import your own data and export data out of the system as well. So as I said, in addition to the search and browse pages, you can build collections in here, and those collections may not be just your own research data, it can incorporate elements from all these other data sets that are in this kind of shared community space. So this is where you can see the uh, impact of building collections and relationships between things. Uh, where you can visualize these as networks within the Honey system and start to explore and discover these other networks that other people have created and navigate through these knowledge connections that are constantly iterating and constantly developing and that's something that can go on and on. Uh, and then you can also export your data from that Honey space. So Honey in itself is not an end point of this process. It could sit anywhere in this process. You could do work in Honey, create a data set and export it from Honey and move it into a Maker instance, for example or store it in the data crate for preservation purposes or to move it into, an, into a repository that can be harvested by other aggregators. Uh, so each of these points is a kind of opening into other areas rather than it being a kind of pipeline or workflow. So some conclusions from this work that we're at at this stage, uh, and there's much more that we can do in this kind of space, uh, but throughout what we've been talking about, it's in, about embracing that kind of continual design thinking. You can see each of these elements is developed in response to particular problems, but also raise other problems and means that we can return and keep on iterating through those design processes in each of those areas. Things like the data crates, for example, uh, there are many applications potentially there that people like Peter are exploring that go well outside of this sort of domain into other areas. Uh, and that's a really interesting kind of, uh, an interesting example of the sort of possibilities that this work can raise. So replacing some of those issues of just coordinating kind of disparate groups and having people cooperate and share these uh, areas of knowledge and these ways of working in these community kind of spaces. And it's working iteratively with preservable data. So something like the data crates is both a preservation option but also a way of moving data. And those crates can be opened up again and you can re-engage with that material and do new things with it. It's developing up that, that bottom-up approach at all levels of this system, so everything from the funding model and the way that funding is selected and assigned uh, and the projects that get up and running through to people developing their Amica instances through to material going into something like Honey and people developing their own relationships. This is all things that comes from the research community and is coming from individual researchers and research communities in that bottom-up kind of way. And for all of that, the idea is to open up users and open up the possibilities for users to be more associative and expressive and creative and explore some of these uh, both sustainable and ephemeral possibilities. Thank you. So our final paper today is applying, sorry, is applying user-centric design to archives by Michael Smith and Janet Bellat. So Michael Smith has more than 25 years of experience in the archives and information management profession, and he has been manager for information management at the City of Sydney for the past year, and was city archivist for the city for four years prior to this. And Janet Galata has been an information professional for over 25 years as well. She has a master's in information science and a diploma in archives administration. And Janet's early career was with the State Archives and Records Authority of New South Wales, specializing in digital work. So I'll back up to you. Hi, I think we've had.
had some fabulous speakers this afternoon. Um, Michael and I are going to take a slightly different tack and we'll be speaking today about our recent experiences in applying user design, user-centred design, when designing and implementing an archives management system at the City of Sydney. So to start with, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. The City of Sydney is a local government authority which takes in the central business district of Sydney and stretches over a 27 kilometre radius into surrounding suburbs. The city and its collection dates from 1842. We have over 12,500 shelf metres of archives, including over 120,000 photographs. We're both a business and a collecting archive. At the city, we're very committed to open and transparent access to information. We have a search room in our city location, and we also deal with over 5,000 written requests for information each year. We have some long-term programs that are aimed at promoting open archives. For example, for 20 years, we've had an active volunteer program, and we currently have about 30 volunteers who are involved in item-level description of our archives. We're also, we also have a well-supported digitisation program. A few years ago, we started the process to plan to the project to introduce a new archives management system. And at that point, our archives were spread across 13 different systems, including some very aged systems, which are now unsupported. The project to implement a new system is known as Campus, the City Archives Management and Public Access System. So that's the project name, but not actually the system name. As background research for the system, we reviewed an audience development survey that had been conducted by our history team, which identified broad user groups, and also a service review, which included an in-depth examination of the types of information access requests that we receive. So in the last year, we have merged those 13 systems into one. We've migrated over a million records, and we're releasing many new items. So both Michael and I had many more grey hairs than when we started. Out of interest, can I ask by show of hands, how many of you have been involved in one uh, project to design or implement an archives management system? There's more hands than I would have expected. How many more than one? Not so many. It doesn't happen all that often. So when we were presented with the opportunity, we chose to pause, consider, dream just a little bit, throw away our traditional beliefs about archival access, and identify and challenge all of our assumptions. And most of all, we were going to focus on the user. Archival systems are usually designed for archivists. They're hard for novices or even professional researchers to use. We require them to complete a range of obscure and unintuitive challenges. So we challenge you to take a close look at how easy other systems are. Admit it's okay to provide a Google type search or even an eBay type interface. Dare to think of archives as a commodity. This is the era of the information marketplace after all. We can't continue to expect users to access archives on our terms. If we don't want to become obsolete, then we need to understand who our users are, what it is that they want and expect, and we need to design and keep designing to meet user needs. As Arne says, we need to start with value. <coughs> Think of the fire triangle, which some of you may be familiar with. It has heat and fuel and oxygen as the three sides of the triangle. And without any one of those three elements, you can't have fire. Without any one of these three elements of capture, manage, preserve and provide access, we don't achieve value in our archives. Provide access is at the base of the triangle because each decision we make 
in capturing and in managing and preserving our archives needs to have access in mind. This is our key value proposition. Okay, so we, uh, we took the approach with our, our project to, uh, to use user-centered design. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail into to what the process is, but more about some of the examples from how we applied it uh, in our project. Um, but user-centered design is about understanding your target audience and designing a solution that needs your audience or your user needs. Um, it's also interesting to point out, important to point out, we didn't follow this as a as a single linear process that you know we started with emphasize, empathize, entered in the test, and that's the end of the process. So as, as other speakers have said, it's iterative, uh, you can apply it to parts of your project, um, and you can apply it to, to small collections as much as you can apply it to large collections. But I think the key point is, is starting off with that concept of empathize. And it actually seems to be one of the key messages that I'm getting from the conference today is that concept of empathy. So what is it like for our users to try and access our archives? And uh, our experience and, and the research that we did is that it's, it's not always a great experience. Um, so we're asking ourselves, what is the current user experience? Uh, is it giving them what they want? Uh, how can we improve their experience? Uh, what sort of feedback are we getting and are we listening to it? Um, and how can we help them to engage? What would make them land on our web page and go, wow, that's amazing. Uh, and we do, we always have things in our collection that people would land on it and say, wow, that is amazing. Okay, so Janet mentioned that we did uh, an audience uh, survey for our history and archives resources. And the audience survey actually came back with some, uh, some interesting results. And one of those results was they looked at what are the different user types, the different levels of user uh, within our collection. And they came up with these three levels of user, the skimmers, the delvers, and the deep divers. Uh, we then uh, looked into more detail about those three <coughs> user levels and identified the percentage of our user base are reflected by those three levels. And it's interesting that, I mean, it depends on how you measure it, I know there's lies, Dan lies in these statistics, and, but we found that 98% of our users are skimmers. 2% are delvers, roughly, less than 0.1% are deep divers. And the interesting questions that we started to ask ourselves was, do we assign different values to the different user types? Because I think, as archivists, we assign a much greater value to the deep divers who are our serious researchers, and very little value to the skimmers. And delvers are somewhere in the middle. Uh, we put up with them, but yeah, we're really interested in the serious researchers. So that then uh, led to, to other questions, is how do we cater to uh, our largest user groups? Um, so the service levels we provide, or need to provide, uh, for skimmers, we decided they're likely going to be self-service. Highly unlikely that they are ever going to set foot in an archive. Our delvers are largely self-service, but need some assisted access. And then we've got the deep divers. They can do some self-service, um, but they need a higher level of assistance from the archivists. So this raises the next question is, can you ever design a solution that will cater to your deep divers anyway, or will they always require that additional input from your archivists? And our, our assumption was that's the case. It's not to say we didn't cater for them at all in our solution, but remember they are the less than 0.1% of our current user base. So then we looked at what are the access methods we need to provide to those different user groups. So we've identified um, that for the skimmers, it's browsing, they want us like a surprise me kind of button, what I, I tend to call the, uh, the executive engagement button, so when the executive says, what have you got in your collection? You point them to the you know, surprise me button. It gives them the, that wow, 
factor and they don't actually have to do anything too difficult. Um, and then they, and they navigate from general web search. So, so they search on Google, it's correct for them to our page, and, and that's pretty much the limit to what our skimmers are likely to do. Delvers, they will do simple searches on our site. Um, they'll search within categories maybe, they'll apply simple filters, um, and they might enter from somewhere like Trove. And they'll do all of the things that the skimmers do as well. And then the deep divers, they're going to be doing more detailed searches, including things like location-specific searching, uh, navigating via relationships. So they're doing the, that more complex thing. And then for us, that's our thing, our, our user groups like professional historians, uh, heritage architects, those sorts of groups. So, this is our, our current user ex experience for one of our systems. And, and this is really one of my uh, absolute uh, pet hates is somebody goes onto our, our site, um, runs a search, and the first several pages of search results are things like activities, agencies, and things like that, that our users just aren't interested in. They don't want that. They came to search on our site, they want archives, they want items. So, oh, by the way, tip of the day, if you ever land on an archive site and you don't know what to, don't know what to search on, search for horse. Go away and try it. Every archive site that we landed on, we've searched for horse, you always get results. <laughs> if it's an English language. And they're always interesting. Why wouldn't horses be interesting? Okay, now here's a telling story. So we, this is a part of our background research. Sorry. Is we looked at our, our current 13 or so systems. Uh, now, what's really interesting on this is Historical Atlas is a site that we redeveloped uh, a few years ago, 500 records. So 500 records out of our 1 million records gets 40% almost of our online access. And that's, that's, that's not difficult to achieve. What's really depressing is Archives Investigator, which is our main archives management system, that's the 2% hiding up the top there. Uh, archive Pix is the next. Uh, most used system, which is our, our photo collection of about 80,000 items. So we do need to ask ourselves, uh, why does a, a resource like Historical Atlas get 40% of our use? Is it because it's just easier to use, or because of people just lost maps, or it's somewhere in between? Um, as part of our process, we also identified our user personas. I should point out, Taking the, uh, the user-centered design approach is not uh, a, a, you know, exclusive to uh, your project methodology. So you can use the two together. So we're using an agile project methodology with a user-centered design. So those, those two work well together. Um, so we identified a, a range of, uh, of personas and we've designed different entry levels for each of those personas within our system design. Now, having said that uh, we want to throw away you know, all of the uh, assumptions about how we present archives to the public, um, we did start, of course, with the, the usual industry standards around metadata and that sort of thing. But then we started looking at some key uh, value propositions. One of them is, what metadata is most likely to facilitate access to our users? And when we did that uh, in-depth survey of those 5,000 requests we respond to every year, we found that more, more than 80% are uh, location centric. So what we get from that is we need to have geolocation as a, as a key element to our system design. How can we bring to light items that people wouldn't normally think about? Um, this is, uh, if you're in Jeff uh, Adams' presentation this morning, this is the thing about how do you present the archives to non-researchers? Which is you know, the executive part. Uh, and how can improved metadata support uh, our archives business processes and also create greater visibility to our donated collections? Okay. So we came up with some business rules. And some of those basic business rules are things like um, the title field, is going to be a maximum of 100 characters for the items in our collection. And when we looked at our data, we had some, uh, some of our sources where the title field was more than 1,000 characters. 
So if you think you're doing it, if you think of people doing that Google type search or the eBay type search, they're not going to read through a thousand characters to get that final thing. We're also tackling issues of things like transcription versus description. So the example of that, that photo on the screen there is, uh, now it's actually annual contracts for war. We don't know what's going to be in that file, don't we? Will our users know what's in that file? Does it, is anybody ever going to look at the file with a title like that? Uh, so the, but the practice has been, if that's what's written on the file, that's what you put into the title field in our archive system. And that's what we're going to move away from. So it's archival description, not archival transcription. Also looking at things like consistent fields across all the templates, um, and also looking at things like what is the value of the metadata in its own right. So we're looking beyond the metadata that comes standard and thinking about what else would have value. So for our users, if they're looking at building plans or photos, are the buildings in those plans or photos extant? Then we're also looking at uh, things like uh, recording the, ar the architect. And what that allows you to do is eventually build uh, searches uh, where your metadata actually takes on the value of its own. So you could do a search and say, show me all of the, build the buildings built by a particular architect that are still extant and present that to me on a, on a map of the city. Uh, so that's, that's where your metadata starts to have value beyond the actual content itself. Some other basic rules we came up with. Uh, Rule one, users have to be in, able to engage without direction, without knowing anything about archives. They don't even have to know about the horse thing. Um, rule two, when searching and browsing, users will see items. They are not going to be able to search on any of our contextual entities. They can browse to them through the relationships, so the, the contextual entities provide the enrichment of what they're seeing in items, but they're not seeing them as part of search results. Uh, the system will be designed to meet user expectations with the public taking precedence over the archive staff and, and other internal users. So the public actually has precedent in our design rules. It goes down really well with the archives team. Um, and rule four, simple, uncluttered page layout with minimal text. So we don't have 20 page user guides on, on our site. In fact, if we can't say it in a couple of paragraphs, then it goes off into a more informational page that I suspect nobody will ever click on. So this is uh, what our system is looking at like now. Um, so we've, uh, we've been working on, on the design and uh, the migration of those million records. If you ever want to lessen in frustration, migrating million records from 13 different systems, can you believe, and, and with very little data validation in those systems, I have to say. So date fields that are free text, we came up with 15 different spellings of February. <laughs> you wouldn't have thought it was possible. Think about random spaces within the word, and you can get up to 15, and, and, and changing the order of the letters as well. So this is where we've ended up. We, we don't go live for another six weeks, which kind of makes you look right weird here and not tearing our hair out somewhere else. Um, but there's your three ways of getting into the collection. We've got simple Google search is the first big bar you see. We've got browse by collection, and some of those are very, very targeted. So top left is development and building records, and if they click on that, they can just search development and building records, which is about 400,000 or something like that. And some of them are, are browsing and, and so on. Um, and then you've got browse and search by map, uh, which is our, our third uh, way of getting into the collection. Um, so we've gone with a, uh, a system that was developed by um, New Zealand Micrographics, which is the Reclock system, um, and they do have a, a store outside, so um, they can actually show you the, the prototype of our, our solution if, uh, if you're interested in the browse. So our metadata went from uh, something like uh, four or five fields in, in Archives and Investigator, which is our main archives management system, to we've got about 100 fields. 
not all of them really use, depending on the nature of the records. Um, and we don't present fields if they don't have any data in them. But you're actually starting to think about data in more than just description. How will that metadata help to filter your results? Um, how will it help to uh, identify records with similar attributes? So having metadata just as a, uh, uh, an assist to searching is not the only consideration. And we, we've actually gone quite granular in, in how we're collecting the metadata, which allows us to get, get that much greater validation of our, our information as well. Oh, and the other thing we're doing is, uh, so we're actually migrating about uh, 350,000 records from, from our EDRS. Uh, so some of those are born digital. Um, so there is also considerations around how do we present uh, all of that without overwhelming our collection. Uh, so for example, for those uh, 100,000 files, we're not providing a searchability of the, the documents within those files. Uh, but the, you can search on the files and then you can navigate, navigate down to the contents. So those are the sort of design thing, decisions we're making as well. We're also enriching with data from other systems, other business systems. So where we can pull data out of, in our case, Pathway is our main business system. We're pulling data out, adding that into the metadata for those records and then migrating it into our, our new system. And our data model still looks very, very similar to the Australian series system. Um, we've got some new entities there that we didn't have before, um, so we don't have a lot of data in those, but we're building that up as, as time goes on. Geolocation, I said, was fairly critical. Uh, in the million records we've migrated, we've got about 100,000 that are geolocated. Uh, so we've got about 90% yeah, yet to go. So, so a lot of this is still a work in progress. So what does the future hold? Um, Location-based services, you, know, you want to be able to walk down the street and say, what did this look like 100 years ago? How are we going to get there? We've already developed a, an application in our GIS system to allow you to record, for, say for photos, where the photographer was standing, what direction they were facing, and then what buildings are captured. Um, so our volunteers are going to be starting to work to build up that metadata over the next couple of years, and then we'll be able to release that functionality. Thank you. saw this coming some years ago, so we've actually started uh, volunteer, in our volunteer program to, to build this metadata uh, already before we even started this project. Um, and, and I think that's one of the, the takeaways of, of uh, how we've approached this, is we want to build the capacity for metadata that potentially we can't even use yet, but we want to be able to use in the future. So some of the fields we've added are actually more um, in anticipation of what we want to capture. Um, but in terms of, so the example I showed you there with the before and after the three fields to the, you know, 30 odd fields, um, that, that project started about two years ago. Uh, for our photos, we started about three years ago to, to, to build on the, the existing data. So a lot of our, our volunteer work for, for quite a few years now has been going over already cataloged and having the index records. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question also for the last two speakers. As you state by name, my name is Soros Christensen. I represent the City Archive of Aarhus in, yeah, in Scandinavia, in, uh, um, in Denmark, sorry. Um, within the last two or three years, we have been going through more or less the same process that I now witnessed in, uh, in Sydney. Um, fascinating, fascinatingly, we have I think it's more or less the same conclusions. 
So, um, but that also means that I could, as a closer, ask you some questions. Um, and the first question is concerning music groups. And uh, you made uh, this threefold division, and uh, you sort of ended up by concluding that, that you call them the divers, the professional uses only represent 0.1%. Useful, but if you look at the documents C or the items search for, I'm sure they represent a uh, much higher percentage. Um, how do you kind of balance then? I mean, the number of users versus the number of documents or items used. Um, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, I should say though that we ended up making a, 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 a interface very similar to the uh, to the interface that I actually you ended up with. So it's that criticism and it's very interesting in it. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think what we found was when we were looking at the deep divers is they are often, uh, well they are, they do still take a lot of our time. We actually spoke to some of the professional historians who fall into that, that category. And, and we asked them, do you search within things like series? And they said no. They search for records within a series. They don't search for series. They don't search for activities. And this is the professional historians. Uh, and that, they're, they're really the, the top of our uh, deep diver list. Then you've got, then you know, uh, heritage architects that also do a lot of research in our collection. And, and those are the, the groups that do, do come back again and again. So, so they are repeat visitors, um, so they do get to know our systems, but they don't search for series. Uh, so our system is not taking away anything that they're currently using, and it's actually giving them a whole lot of tools that they, they would still like as well. Um, but when it comes to particularly uh, series that we haven't uh, completed the range, full arrangement of the description of, um, they still need to come talk to the archivists and we need to get the boxes in. And so there's still that very interactive kind of relationship with them. Um, well, this is what we anticipate in six weeks' time. I'm going to spread the love a little bit here. So, to the National Archives of the Moon, I have some, I got a question for you. So, how did the archivists at the National Archives of Norway take to this more user-oriented design? I know I struggled with it when I first was introduced to it at National Archives UK. It took me a really long time to get on board with it. I eventually did. So how did you introduce this to them? How did the archivists feel about this? And how did you get them to kind of invest in the process? <laughs> it's been interesting. Well, I guess we were at the brink of civil war in Germany. <laughs> Now, because some of them, uh, they, they, they approach this in time as very um, fulfilling, right? And they grab the opportunity to work something new. And then there are some who resist with all their effort. So it's, it's and, and we're working on how to migrate from the resistors into you know, the levers. But it, it's a long process. And uh, especially when we had a, a previous version of our vision of 2025, when we said nobody should think about archiving. That really did ring, ring, ring some bells around the around the National Archives of Norway. So. I just want to respond to the questions around user-centered design and metrics, <coughs> because I think that uh, coming particularly from a university perspective, where we have suffered the weaponization of statistics in our general lives, let alone our you know, performative ones, um, there's been a long opportunity to reflect on this. And you know, I have an issue, I guess, with user-centered design because it's, it's, it performs so neatly to the neoliberal project that you know, these things are designed simply for a use and therefore a user, rather than for some of the more abstracted ideas around value that are much harder to measure. So something like community-centered design becomes a much, a much more interesting problem in terms of how you might think about value, uh, as do other uh, things like you know the, the value of meandering through information rather than efficiently mowing your way through the service, um, which I think is where a lot of um, structured support now exists. Um, so we, we found this often with Honey that we try a lot to talk to people about the idea that um, getting lost in data might just be as useful and interesting as um, you know, 
demonstrating that seven hundred people down there twenty five million interviews. <coughs> Are there any other questions from the floor? Okay, so I'm going to ask another question. But I'm going to ask a question to the entire group. What do you think, whether you call it community-centric design or user-centric design, what do you think the biggest challenges are? And how do you overcome those challenges to, to get to the end point, to, to achieve uh, the desired outcome, whatever that happens to be? Uh, I think uh, the question I opened with around trying to think about the ways we can redress domination and gatekeeping remains a massive problem for the sector because really the biggest issue here is the uh, social inequalities, the level of information that exists not just around the world. So we have ex extraordinary disparities um, of both on the supply side and the consumption side. Who gets to use data but also who gets to generate it. Um, and they also exist internally inside our communities in different ways. And I don't think we're attentive enough to those issues. We're, we're very focused on the tech and the tools and the usages and the users rather than the massive social problems that are reiterated through the practices we engage in on daily basis. Okay, um, there's, there, there's a lot of challenges, but I think the main, from, from my perspective, the main one is that we work so design user centric. You don't know all the answers. So you have to kind of, you don't know, you know what you want to achieve, but you don't know how to get there. Uh, so you're kind of walk, walking around in the dark and not really knowing where to go. I'm not losing kind of one's way in that, in the jungle, it's, 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 it's a challenge. And also having to, um, as an organization, face the fact that we don't know everything. So we need to be sort of vulnerable. And that's, it's painful to show that we don't know this or this or this and, and admit it to, to kind of the, the rest of the, the world that we don't know how, we don't have all the answers. And it goes kind of a, we need to, humil uh, to be humble to, to actually achieve uh, sort of the sign in, in, in a proper fashion. And it's challenging. I think, I think one of the, the main challenges we've uh, come across is identifying uh, our potential users. So we know what our current users are, we know a lot about our current users um, from the research we've done. Um, we can speculate about, particularly for the, for the skimmers, we can speculate about what they get through things like Google Analytics. What we don't know about is the people that are not using the archives, but would if there was an easy way or a way that they understood to get into the collection. Um, so one of the things we are looking at is, is releasing a public API so, so that other people can develop ways of getting into our collection. But um, also we need to uh, look at you know, what groups are there out, you know, in our communities that want to get access to our archives, but just don't know how to do it. So I guess my other question, taking into account the whole the very valid point you make around the power that holds our this. Um, and I think it, it's, it's something that's come through the conference since this morning. And I guess there's, there's two aspects to that for me as an artist, which is do we have the right capacity within our institutions to do user centric design? Uh, because I think that there's a question here for me if I'm a small artist and I want to engage in this, all of the institutions we're looking at here, I would argue, fairly well resourced and have the levels of access to expertise that a small community archivist does not have, and yet they have equally valid information that should be exploited to the best possible way for the communities that we work for. So I guess my challenge to you is, if I had very little resources, how would I do user centric design in a more cognizant way about the power I hold, but equally within the resources that I have? I'm not sure whether this is an answer to that question, but uh, I was I was thinking. I mean, it certainly applies in that space where a lot of the conversation is still around us doing design for our users and our users being out there in the world and us being here and it's our stuff and we want to get them to access our stuff. Uh, something that works both in large institutions but also in those those smaller institutions or less well resourced is to think well. If the users are the designers of that experience and the users are the ones engaged in the designer process, then we're helping to 
hopefully provide a space where we can facilitate that sort of design process in some way or support it or create a space for it, uh, then it both regresses the power balance and also looks at resourcing as to who is responsible for that design in the first place in the first place. Well, I think any organization, even though it's, it's just kind of one person, you can, you can think user design, user centric design, and, and it's all about rather than having all the answers, asking people. You meet when you have interaction with, I don't know, whoever it is, ask them, is this working for you? Is this okay? Is this, do you understand? Is something you don't understand? You're going to be open instead of kind of saying, this is what you need. Because if you say this is what you need, then it, it doesn't really match with the user says. So it's just being in, uh, interested in how, how do they perceive you or your organization. Now that's one thing. And then the other thing is kind of try to do it iteratively. Try to test out things and use, use a small scale. You can use cardboard boxes. You don't have to have kind of a design team of 10 IT people. You can you can use cardboard boxes. You can draw things. You can you can use it. It's quite simple. And ask if if I move this box over there, would this work? So it's, it, it, you can do it at a small scale and then you can use it at a large scale. So think small. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, from our perspective, you know, the example of those those 500 maps. Um, got 40% of our, of our use. So, so I think taking that approach with that, that high interest, you know, the, the, the archives that have that high level of interest and trying to find out what, is, what do they actually want to get out of that, that set of records. Um, so user centered design, but the, the empathize is, is the absolute critical part in, in you know, understanding who are your users and who are your potential users who can do that. Just before I hand the pen. <laughs> <laughs> I always sit from sheep, not horses. Sorry. Sheep. Works every time. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, we've got one right here. Another one over there. We'll start with the lady over here and then the gentleman over there. Hi, uh, Simone Sharp from the Stonington History Centre in Melbourne, uh, in Melbourne with the Melbourne Cult, so I apologise about that. Um, one of the things, I mean, I really loved this session, so thank you all. Um, I'm interested in discoverability, which is one of those things, you know, we're all interested in, we're all wanting to make our own records more discoverable to the people who come to us, but what about people that don't come to us, like we've just um, had our photograph collection become discoverable on Toronto recently. But that's, again, people, I'm still telling people about Toronto. And so I'm just wondering how we get those archives, all those beautiful records, out to the people that don't think to search in archives, if anyone's going to be I'm not pretty bad for this job. Uh, yeah, I, for us, it was actually quite critical that somebody could, could run a Google search and, and go straight into the item in our archives. Uh, so, but we also have an integration with, uh, with Trove. So when I say we, we want to take more for the skimmers and less for the deep divers, we're, we're not ignoring the deep divers. They're still coming through Trove and they're coming through those other sources. Uh, but you know, again, I think it's that thing that we were getting a lot of responses in that history audience survey uh, came back with as well, that people are saying, why can't you just have a simple Google-like search that gives access to your collection? Um, and, and that's not actually that easy to achieve uh, because you need to have a certain uh, uh, critical mass of metadata before, before that's actually practical. Um, but as Janet mentioned, we've been fortunate we've got a volunteer program that's been going for the last 20 years. And really the majority of our item of description is because we've got those volunteers. Yeah, well, um, you're going to have a great time when that thing goes live because Recollect is, sorry. I find the problem of search really interesting, right? So why do we search? Research. And it's a really fundamental human quality in a way. Um, 
And I don't think we've reflected enough on that. So your company also position, which is like a great collection, and I want people to be able to discover it, rather than uh, thinking about what is it people search for and how do they do that? And, and so when we developed Honey, we, we sat down to think about humanities researchers and how they search. And often how they search is through trails of relationships. So they don't necessarily discover the thing that they're explicitly looking for, they discover something else. Serendipity search, non-logical search. Unfortunately, single text box search, which dominates everything at the moment, is incredibly limiting, um, particularly if it's delivered by Google because it's only going to give you back what it thinks you already know. Okay. And, and so those really exciting aspects of search, the things that, we, that really drive us as humans to want to be more than ourselves, to, to do something beyond who we think we already are or who we think we already know, is limited at the moment by some pretty poor search technologies that are predominant. So how do we rethink that? How do we think about the ways in which people might start by searching broadly, but then want to narrow, or might start narrow, but then want to go broader? Um, how do we think about search that's done visually, or that's done through time or space, rather than text? What happens for people who aren't very confident in text? At the moment, there's very little for them in terms of search and fulfilling the search. Those desires, I guess, to, to want and, uh, and so I'd like us to go back philosophically and start to think a little bit more deeply about search itself and build the tools we want and not just rely on the tools that were sadly deleted by very limited 14-year-old boys living in their mother's basements because that's what we're getting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, to our other uh, person who had a question. Okay, now. Um, well, look, with, with the Recollect thing, you're going to have a great time. I'm, at the University of Newcastle, we put our system on to recollect. You can find things wonderfully with the search box, all right, which is great. Um, but the issue here, and I think something that will make you happy, Deb, is that uh, once we put the material out there and people can find it, um, the, mo the more unfettered that thing is out there, the better able people are to create those sorts of systems that you're talking about, like new graphical systems of finding things. Okay, it's, it's the big problem at the moment is, okay, we've got sheds with stuff in it and our websites reflect what we've been digitising to get that stuff out of the shed and into the digital world. And it's still coming through our shed and we've got this sort of custodianship thing happening with all the various institutions. But if we can get all that stuff out there, in other words, really let it go and um, the metadata is very important because it's like the consciousness of the digital object. And I've got problems with the way metadata makes its way through these platforms because it gets stripped along the way from the time that you originally scan it. But if we have a look at a digital object similar to ourselves and um, we have to put into that digital object everything that we think we know as a consciousness of ourselves, who we are, uh, what we like, then those digital objects have a better time of interacting with themselves with these new AI robots that are supposed to be coming around the corner. But it also gives people the ability who want to create more graphic ways of portraying data, as they did with our Flickr subdivision plans. This one guy just Google mapped all 700 of our subdivision plans, so he didn't have to go anywhere near our site to find it. But there were gaps, there were holes in you know, the Hunter Valley where those subdivision plans weren't because they were lying in another institution's collections and they didn't have it out there for him to get access to. So there's a real exciting um, world out there waiting um, once we get our stuff out there and properly metadata for all these other people who we don't know, who might be skimmers, that might become delvers. I mean, they do change. They don't all stay skimmers and delvers and deep divers, I guess, I don't know. But um, there is, you know, it's, it's trying to get our, our, our mitts off the stuff and getting out there in, in the community so people can add their own, you know, ways of finding it for themselves. I think there was a question in there. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what it was. But I, I, I do want to pick up on the discussion around discoverability because I think grappling was the metaphor of discoverability in the archive sector for a while now. And you know, it's not just indigenous schools that find the use of the word discovery problematic in the archive. These are collections of objects you just said, you know, talked about getting your mitts on the objects. And they're, they're sur surrounded by processes that are driven 
by a central notion of an object. So we, we talk about objectives or objectivity. Right? There's a lot of object going on here. What if the purpose of dis was not discovery but about making connections? Right? What if we thought about it like that? Because then you start thinking about relationships, not objects. And then you start thinking about community. And you start thinking about all these other ways in which we might engage with archives that are not reiterations of the very problematic foundation of the archive in this place. And that's, I think, where I want us to go, you know, is to start to think about the other possibilities the archive holds. I'm not suggesting that everything about archives is um, dependent on its, its foundations or its origin stories. We can move past that. But it will take a lot of work when we're thinking of those some of those fundamental metaphors like discoverability and objectivity <coughs> and object orientation and so on. Anybody else want to comment? Be the last comment. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It has been a really interesting session. A very big thank you to all of our speakers and presenters today, and thank you to the audience for coming and listening.